We say God loves us. We write about it, sing about it, post online about it, but we struggle to truly believe it. Maybe we've experienced the gospel at some point, but we moved on, thinking it was for those who've never heard it before. But we've still got our secret sins, relationships that are broken. After all, how can we expect to love others if we don't really believe that God loves us unconditionally? The gospel is the most beautiful thing we've ever heard. And yet, it just seems so unbelievable. How can one man's story change our own? It's just too good to be true. Or is it? Welcome. Good to see all of you here this evening. Man, it is a wonderful Monday night. Have these presentations not been just incredible to all of us? Hallelujah. Well, if you're brand new here this evening, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for making the time to partner with us for this unbelievable week of renewal. My name is Philip Milo Savlovich, and I am your host this evening and the rest of this week. We want to welcome our Light Bears Ministry for partnering with us in this time of study with Pastors David Ashrick and Ty Gibson, and this evening, Professor Jeffrey Rosario. Have they not been excellent? Wow. Those talks have been so life changing and encouraging. We also want to welcome those of you watching online. We've been getting messages from all over the world. It is so neat to see who are tuning in from every part, Singapore, New Zealand, China, different parts of Asia, Africa. I mean, I've been seeing messages from people all over. And so thank you for tuning in. We know that you who are watching this, either live right now with us or on the archives, you're choosing the best place to be right now and watching this, it's going to be so moving for you. Well, friends, I want to encourage you to continue remembering you're making the best decision to partner in making Jesus your priority at the very beginning of the year. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to be pretty straight with you. Distractions are dream killers. This year, I don't want you to be a distracted believer and when you partner with Christ at the very beginning of the year, saying, God, I want to prioritize you and the kingdom, you're prioritizing, elevating your life to the very best thing that you can be, and that is deepening your discipleship journey with Christ. And so you're doing the absolute best thing. Right now, in front of you are Uconnect cards. They are a larger card that's right there in front of you. If you want to communicate with us in any way, you can do that with the Uconnect card. Some of you are maybe watching online and you're like wondering, hey, I want to communicate with these guys. I want to share something about what's going on in my life, a prayer request. I'd like to transfer my membership. I want to get baptized. I want to, that's the place to do it. So online you can do that. Just click on the very website for the whole Unbelievable series. Go to the very bottom and you can get a Uconnect card as well. I also want to encourage you with a Bible verse this evening. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, He who began a good work in us will complete it when Jesus comes. You know, that's what this evening is. It is Jesus doing the very work of completing your and my journey of deepening with Christ. A big word we use in church, sanctification. God is deepening who he wants you and me to be. And he promises when we prioritize him and the kingdom, you're going to keep growing into who Christ needs you to be. So this evening, thank you for making this a priority, but also thank you for bringing yourself here. If you have a prayer request, I want to remind you, the very evening, at the very end, there will be a time of prayer as well, right here to your left. And those of you online will have 30 minutes 
that we're on the prayer line. The phone number will be on the Unbelievable website page. God bless you, friends. Good evening. Happy Monday. Let's stand together as we worship. High King of Heaven, we come before you this evening, recognizing that even though you are the High King of Heaven, you are also at our side as our friend, our Savior, our companion, and our guide. For that, we are so profoundly grateful. Lord, we're also grateful for the privilege we have of gathering in this place this evening, this warm place. We've come in from the cold outside, and the cold is more than just the temperature. It's the reality of so much on our planet right now. So to come in into the warmth of community, the warmth of communion with you, the warmth of grace, is a blessing indeed. We pray that you would be present with us this evening, that you would challenge us, inspire us, change us, that you would give Dr. Jeffrey words, might his message go to our hearts. And for all this, at the end of the evening, we will thank you and follow you more deeply. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. This is the Monday night crowd, so this, you're the real ones. You are the real ones. I always tell people at these light bearers meetings, it's incredible that people come out after a hard, long day of work and you're exhausted and you come out for session after session after session. I don't even know if I would do that, so... So it's an incredible honor to be here. Thank you for hosting us. So we're in session five, is that right? We're in part five in this series. And obviously I'm slightly late to the party. But from what I can tell, from what I gather, we've been building this narrative of Scripture. And the whole point of this unbelievable series, as you know, is these are the mountain peaks, right? These are the chapters in the story of redemption that are so good that it's almost too good to be true, right? In our story so far, we have been constantly going back to the Old Testament story over and over again. And we've been anchoring uh, the story we're telling from the promises of God, the covenant of God. We heard about Abraham, Father Abraham and his kids in God's covenant to, to Israel. And... We're going back to that narrative to draw another strand to that. I think tonight's message takes us uh, to the next stage of this story. We have learned that the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, was not merely a spiritual covenant. Actually, that's what I'm going to emphasize tonight. It actually addresses the fractured relationships, right? We're going to be talking about the social sphere. The Abrahamic covenants were not merely, was not merely a covenant between humans and God, but that it actually touches on on this dimension as well, the social dimension. So in the beginning, we get the the story of the introduction of guilt, of of division, of animosity against human, human to human. The fracturing of human relationships. So I'm going to make an argument this evening that when we read about these Old Testament promises and these covenants that God made with, with, with the Old Testament church, as I'll call it tonight, we're actually reading something deeper than, than mere spiritual things. The Abrahamic covenant and the Messianic promises not only address humanity's relation to God, but also the fractured nature of human relationships. And so God's covenant envisions a social realignment. As we read about the the gospel going to the Gentiles, which is what we're here for tonight, we're reading about the fulfillment of these promises that are calculated for a social realignment. There's a healing process that's taking place in the Bible, and the church, right, because we're going from the Old Testament church, and hopefully tonight, before we leave tonight, we can confront an invitation for the church, for today, for us, that the church is invited into something, invited to promote, and there's this phrase we're going to talk about, righteousness and justice. Can you say that with me? Righteousness and and justice. We're going to try to unpack that tonight by partnering with God to tear down cultural, racial, and political walls. Are there any cultural, racial, and political walls in our world today? I love the prayer. Uh, and to engage in the advancement of human flourishing. So that's what we're unpacking tonight. And to get us started with that, let's think about this concept righteousness and justice. Because that's the concept that is introduced when Abraham comes into the picture, into the narrative. I know David walked us through uh, the promises to Abraham. I want to highlight something different in that promise that I think takes us to, to confront the way that the world is today. This is from Genesis chapter 18. You remember, this is the original, the original message Uh, part of the original message of the covenant. And then there's this one statement here in Genesis 18, verse 19, God explaining what his vision is, what he has up his sleeve with, with these messianic promises. I have chosen him that he may command, or other translations say, lead his children and his household 
after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what, everybody? Righteousness and justice. Okay, so whatever, whatever is involved in the promise to Abraham, in the call to Abraham, in the covenant with Abraham, it has something to do with righteousness and justice. It has something to do with the realization of this, whatever this is, right? And then the, 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 the following words, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So what do we get there so far? We get that integral to the Abrahamic promise was the doing of righteousness and justice. And we get something more so that, in other words, the promise being fulfilled in Abraham and his descendants, follow me now, was contingent. Are you with me? Contingent on the realization, on the fulfilling of doing righteousness and justice. Meaning that should Abraham and his family, should Abraham and his descendants fail in fulfilling the project of righteousness and justice, that promise which was contingent on that, well, you fill in the, you fill in the blanks, right? The Greek word and the Hebrew words in the Bible for justice they occur over a thousand times, okay? But in English, they appear in different words because it takes different English words throughout the narrative to sort of capture the comprehensive nature of what this righteousness and justice means. It, it applies to the personal, to the social, to the public, to the private, to the political, to the religious, to the human, and even to the non-human. When you and I think of the word righteous, what do you think of? When we're in church and we say so-and-so, so-and-so is righteous, what a righteous person. We often think of personal uh, moral purity, Right? Someone is really righteous. In fact, we even say that, we even say that pejorative. We say, oh, aren't you so righteous, right? We think of personal piety when we think that somebody is righteous. In other words, that word has become a religious word for something very interior, very private, very personal, right? In Scripture, though, that's not, that's not the essence of the word. It is often, it often shows up in a word pair with justice, meaning that there's a relationship between righteousness or righteous and justice that is inseparable. And you find this over and over again in the scriptures. For example, Amos chapter 5. Let, what everybody? Justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a never flowing stream. We get Isaiah 32. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. We get Psalm 72. I'm just giving you a selection, right? Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. I can show you over and over again how the concept of justice is linked inseparably with the concept of righteousness. What do we get from that? We get a new definition of what righteousness is, meaning righteousness is not merely in the realm of personal piety or personal moral purity. Righteousness has a whole lot to do with the outside, right? It has to do with, with, with our relationship outside of ourselves. In other words, there are social implications is what I'm trying to say. Righteousness in the Bible incorporates the idea of doing justice. And doing justice in the Bible conveys the idea of writing what has gone wrong. So the minute we get Genesis chapter 3, the minute we get introduced to the, to the brokenness of, of human relationships, righteousness and just, justice comes into play because it has to do with restoring things to the condition of rightness or rightness, righteousness. It's the right ordering of the universe and the way God intends reality to operate. All right. Blah, 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 right? Definitions. The reason that is so critical, 
in understanding the Abrahamic promises is because we go from there to understand that the whole point of the election of ancient Israel was to model something to the world. Ancient Israel was a prototype. The descendants of Abraham were a prototype. They were the original or to be the original human rights activists in the world. They were to be the ones spearheading the right ordering of the to right what has gone wrong. And no, not just in this in this personal realm, but in the social, in the cultural, in the racial, in the political realm. This is why you'll see where this is all going. We trace this line through all through, through the scriptures, and you get from the Old Testament church to the New Testament church, and then it hits. It explodes in the New Testament church. It was a strategic way to model righteousness and justice on earth. That's what it was all about. A particular nation for the sake of what everybody all nations and that included the gentiles and so when we read the hundreds of promises of the of of the god of the old testament to israel to his church all of those promises are contingent on the church to make accessible to the, other, to the outside world, to the Gentiles, the promises of God. In other words, you can think of it this way. When God made the covenant to Israel and with Israel, do you realize that God was literally making a covenant with the Gentiles? Because the covenant with Israel doesn't even exist separate from the commitment and the promise that God was actually making with the Gentile world. So the whole point of, that, of their existence was to prioritize the other. So in a sense, the most exclusive part of the Old Testament is actually the most inclusive part. Because God is entering into this commitment with the Gentile world. Now here's the powerful thing. You trace the prophets and you run into this idea that the enactment of justice and righteousness on earth is, is to be weighed, is to be measured by how the Gentiles are being treated. Isaiah 42, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. There it is. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. This is Isaiah 42. Listen to this. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you, right? This is speaking of the messianic figure, and give you as a covenant to the people. Now, follow this now. Here we have not God making a, a promise, a theoretical promise, or making a theoretical covenant, but he's actually personified the covenant in the servant, in the Messiah, I will give you, okay, as a covenant to the people. In other words, the promise of God to the people and to the Gentile world was embodied in the Messiah. To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And then this, Isaiah 49. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I want to stress that. God is saying it is too small a thing for this to be just about Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the world. So this is the message over and over and over again. I emphasize this. Because it is mind-boggling that the one assignment, the whole purpose upon which everything is built upon, is the very thing that we see missing throughout the story of the church. In other words, Israel fails. That which was contingent is now in jeopardy, and so enter Jesus. The way that the Bible centers 
the large heartedness of God is put on display in this story of God's promises to the Gentiles. Enter Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. The what, everybody? What Messiah? The Jewish Messiah. And Jesus steps into our frame, and he will literally pick up from this massive story, from this massive history, Jesus will literally shoulder that, and he himself will embody God's covenant in the genealogy of Matthew 1, which I know David took you to briefly just to highlight the, the, the Abraham. But in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, which we all know, you all skip. Nobody reads this stuff, right? We are given the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, which, which some would say is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. So we have here the story of the Jewish Messiah presented in the most Jewish of all the Gospels to a Jewish audience. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and then we have a whole bunch of begots, as you know. And breaking with tradition, where normally you would include men in the genealogies, we are introduced with, to several women, you know. And we have here Tamar. And then we have Rahab. And then we have Ruth who shows up. And then we have a character that's, that, that is so touchy that she's not even mentioned by name. She's just the wife of Uriah, which is Bathsheba, right? So it's, it is fascinating to me how Jesus, this is, remember David was talking about that, that one page that separates the Old from the New Testament that you, that you rip out? We get to the beginning of the story. It's literally Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And, and, and look at the way that the New Testament, so to speak, opens. It opens in the most provocative of ways. We have four women in a genealogy that should really be all about men. And the four women that are chosen are, are suspect. Because Messiah's bloodline includes women who are Canaanites, Moabites, and Hittites. Are you guys following what I'm saying? And if you were a first century reader, and you were reading this gospel, and this is the way that Messiah was being introduced to your faith community, to your tradition, this would have been shocking. And it's a beautiful thing. We've been highlighting over and over in this series, the large-heartedness of, 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 the, of the biblical story. Messiah has Gentile blood coursing through his veins. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Jesus literally, genetically embodies the promise, the promise that was foretold long ago. And where the church fails, this is where Jesus steps into the picture. He doesn't have to even say anything because, because his, his genetic, his, his ancestry says it all, right? So much so that when this Messiah is actually born, we are told that it was a group of Gentiles, pagan foreigners that connected the dots and realized what God was up to, right? Right? It's, this is, the, the, the story is so provocative that you can't avoid the fact that this is, all, this is all crafted this way intentionally. All the while, the religious community, hear me now, the religious community utterly clueless with what, about what God is doing in the world. And those who actually figured it out, those who actually were paying attention were actually the people that the faith community would have considered these pagan foreigners. These are the folks outside of the circle, right? And they're the ones that get what God is actually doing. This is the story, people who have been inoculated against spiritual life by dry religiosity often exhibit the coldness in how Jesus is received, the reception of Jesus in the story. And it's, it's the outsiders, the outcasts that are at the forefront 
of what God is doing. And so Jesus recapitulates ancient Israel. He goes and he, 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 he retraces the footsteps and he takes, uh, he, he shoulders the failed promises of the church. There is this language I put here that Jesus, uh, he embodies the vineyard of the Old Testament because there's a language that shows up over and over again in the Old Testament that, that Israel was the vine, Israel was the vineyard, Israel was the vine that was to bear fruit for the blessing of the nations, right? And then you remember this text where Jesus shows up, and this is in John, where Jesus shows up in John 15, you remember this? And Jesus says, I am the what? It's interesting, it, this always happens when I, when I ask for John ch chapter 15, verse 1. Does Jesus say, I am the vine? What does he say? He says, I am the true vine. Have you ever wondered about that? What, is, what, what did Jesus mean by I am the true vine? Like, why the emphasis on the true? Why not just say, I am the vine? You have to understand, the people listening to Jesus are aware of this textual tradition that, that the faith community, the church, is the vine all over the Old Testament. It's the church that is the vine. It is ancient Israel. And when Jesus shows up, again, provocative, he says, I am the true vine. What he's doing is he, this is a messianic announcement. He is announcing that he is here to shoulder and to fulfill what the church was supposed to do. And so what we mean by recapitulates is uh, there's just a lot of suspicious stuff going on in the narrative of Jesus. It almost feels intentional. Israel is said to be the firstborn in Exodus 4. What Jesus is called the firstborn Israel comes out of Egypt. Well, in Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus is announced in his childhood, he comes out of Egypt. That's 800 years later. Israel passes through the Red Sea. We know that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Israel spends 40 years in the wilderness. When Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness, as Israel is in the wilderness, they receive the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus is in his wilderness of temptation, and he quotes from a specific book in the encounters he has in the wilderness. And, and coincidentally, he's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. There are 12 tribes, and there are 12 disciples. I mean, there's not 11 disciples, and there's not 13. Why? Why do we always have these, these, these perfect analogies? It's almost as if it was intentional. And this is what I mean by Jesus is recapitulating the story of the Old Testament church. So we could say it this way. The Old Testament tells the story that Jesus completes. This means not only that we need to look at Jesus in the light of the history of the Old Testament, but also that he sheds light backward on it. Jesus is thus the end of the line as far as the Old Testament story goes. It has run its completed course in preparation for him, and now its goal and climax has been reached. The arrival of Jesus the Messiah marks a new beginning, indeed a new creation. God is doing his new thing. And Jesus is not only the end of the beginning, he is also the beginning of the end. Is that a tongue twister for you? Jesus is not only the end of the beginning, he's also the beginning of the end. And he's going to do this new thing. Tonight's message is pretty simple. Because this new, this new thing that Jesus is going to do, he's going to do this thing through the New Testament church. But here's the catch. That this new thing that Jesus is going to do is actually not new at all. It's actually a very old thing. In fact, it's so old that in Jesus' day, it was an ancient thing. And what is this thing we're talking about? We're talking about ful the fulfillment of the promise long ago that was always intended to be about the Gentiles. And so this takes us to the story. And this is where we're going to park. We're going to spend a few minutes tonight. And we're going to be looking at what I reckon is one of the most important passages 
in the book of Acts. And I know every preacher gets up, especially these preachers, and they say, this is the most important verse, right? Everybody says, everybody has their important verse in their important chapter. But, but this is actually true, what I'm telling you. <laughs> Acts chapter 10. Okay, follow me. This is the whole shebang. This is it. Acts chapter 10. We have a man named Cornelius. This man named Cornelius is a centurion. Okay. We have his name. We have his position. And he is in Caesarea. Cornelius, centurion, Caesarea. Now, this is Acts chapter 10. And what we're about to read is the conversion, the, the, the conversion story of Cornelius. Now, this is the first detailed account of a Gentile being converted in the New Testament at any length. Okay. The conversion of Cornelius is the most often repeated story in the entire book of Acts. Now, hear me now. In Acts chapter 9, before this guy even shows up to the picture, another individual is converted, and his name is Saul, right? His name is Paul. Now, follow me here. If you can think of any other person in the story of the, the New Testament church that, that the biblical writers should devote the, the most amount of time due to their significance and their impact on Christianity, I reckon it would probably be the apostle Paul. Oh, no takers on that? Is that, a, is that a fair? Right? The Apostle Paul. You know, the guy who wrote half of your New Testament? You're still not impressed. <laughs> Come on, y'all. I need this for the, for the, for the effect. <laughs> the Apostle Paul would be the most important people, person I can think of, right? That's Acts chapter 9. But when you get to Acts chapter 10, the writer of the book of Acts, which, by the way, his name is... Luke happens to be the only writer in the New Testament that is a Gentile. So you know when Luke is writing his account of Christianity, of early Christianity, the most authoritative, the most important account of the early church, Luke is a Gentile and he's saying, yeah, Paul got converted. Now let's talk about Cornelius. The amount of, of textual content devoted to the conversion of Cornelius is more than the amount of, of, of content devoted to the conversion of Paul. It's almost like it's important or something, right? And Luke definitely wants us to have that idea. Something's going on in this story that has implications for the life of the church, for the purpose of the church, and for the promises of God. Now, Cornelius was a centurion. It's not the first centurion we encountered because you heard a couple of nights ago the encounter of Jesus with another centurion. This centurion is based in Caesarea. And Caesarea is, it was the seat of the Roman imperial rule in Palestine. So this is, this is the headquarters of Roman cultural, economic, and political dominance, right? This is the city that to a Jewish audience symbolized the fact that they were dominated by a pagan power. This is the court. This is the, the headquarters, okay? And this is where this guy is from. As a Roman military official, Cornelius quite literally embodies, he symbolizes the thing that the Jews loathe. Okay. And this is going to be the, 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 this is going to be the individual that, that, will, that will figure prominently in this story. When you read about Cornelius, we are told, and I'm in Acts chapter 10 verse 2 if, you, if it's in front of you, we are told something fascinating about his character. Acts chapter 10 verse 2 says, he was a devout man and one who feared God, one who gave alms generously, and one who prayed to God always. Now, this story is going to 
explode the narrow-mindedness and the small-heartedness of the church, right? Who is this guy? This guy is a pagan Roman Gentile. And Luke tells us he's devout. Luke tells us he's worshiping God. And Luke tells us he's praying to God continually. My question to you is simple. What God is this guy praying to and worshiping? Because this guy is outside of of the circle, so to speak. He's on the outside of the church building. He's not not officially in, in, in the religion of Judaism. He's certainly not a Christian. He certainly has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet Luke tells us he is devout, he's worshiping God, and he is praying continually. I I just hope we can read this with the fresh eyes of the original readers. Is it possible that there are people in the world that are having an encounter with God that don't really fit the box that we have in our minds of what that looks like? Is that possible? Could you imagine how explosive this would have been to the original readers? Cornelius is given a loaded summary for his character. I love how N.T. Wright puts it. He says, Cornelius was on the outside of Judaism, but pressing his nose hard against the window to look in. And an angel appears to him. To summarize the story for you, an angel appears to him in Acts chapter 10, and he catches him in his his prayer. And the angel, when, when the angel presents himself, Cornelius is stunned. He's startled. And the angel tells Cornelius that the God of heaven has been receiving his prayers. And then the angel tells Cornelius, there is another guy in in the city in Joppa. And that guy's name is Simon Peter, Cornelius. Send to Joppa and bring Simon Peter into your home because he has important things to tell you. And you wonder, why on earth would an angel, right there in front of Cornelius, why wouldn't the angel simply just say what God wanted to say to Cornelius? Why go to the tedious time and energy to orchestrate the meeting of these two men? Okay, now I'm going to suggest to you that the reason that this is necessary has less to do with Cornelius, you know where I'm going with this, and it has more to do with Peter. Cornelius gathers his men, his servants, rehearses the story, and he says, go to Joppa and, and, and get this man named Simon Peter and bring him here. The men go off and they begin their journey. As they are traveling, right, as they're traveling from Caesarea to Joppa in order to meet Peter, the camera, the camera shifts in Acts chapter 10. And now the scene is in Joppa. And we're told that meanwhile, as these guys are traveling, Peter is in Joppa and he's on top of the balcony there on the rooftop. And he's looking out to the city of Joppa. And the Bible says that he gets really hungry as he's praying. And as he gets really hungry, there's this weird vision that he, enter, that, he, that he sees. And in this vision, there is like a tablecloth that's lowered down. And on this tablecloth, on this sheet tablecloth, there's all kinds of animals on the tablecloth. And then God tells Peter, Peter, rise and eat. And Peter is so shocked. Now listen carefully. He is shocked. Because what he sees on the tablecloth are all kinds of animals that are unclean, that are common. That in the faith community, you would never eat these things. And Peter knows that. And so the vision has to be repeated three times, the Bible says. And after the the third time, the Bible says that Peter's scratching his head. And he's, he's trying to figure out, Luke tells us, he's trying to figure out what the vision means. You, you, you guys follow me? It means something. Luke the Gentile is even telling us. This is supposed to mean something, right? And I like to think that God waits for Peter to be hungry to show him this vision because God himself is hungry, right? 
and the vision of the animals have nothing to do with eating. And it has nothing to do with these animals. It has everything to do with people, which is what Peter is going to come to throughout the course of this vision. And so the shock factor, the reason that God orchestrates and puts in, 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 in his view something that he knew would be shocking to him, I'm telling you, is because God is about to reveal to him how shocking the love of God is uh, for the people. And so God needs to address some issues with his church. And so he orchestrates this meeting uh, because the church has prejudices. The church has misconceptions that God needs, that God needs to, to, to widen, to, to open up. And as Peter is having this vision, God speaks to him, go downstairs there are, there are men at your door, and he hears the knock at the door. And these men are there to get you. Go down and go with them and don't question anything, he tells Peter. Peter goes down and he meets these men, and eventually they arrange to travel back to Caesarea where Cornelius is. And now when, as they travel back, when they enter into Cornelius' home, we're told in the Bible, um, Peter is utterly nervous stepping into this home. One, he is in what town, everybody? He's in Caesarea. And everything that that represents. He's there to see a centurion. And everything that that represents. As he enters the house, he walks in, and the first thing Cornelius does is he drops to his knees. And Peter immediately has to lift him up and say, I am just a man. Get on your feet. Right? Because sometimes people are so sincere that even though technically they're not following the script on how they're supposed to worship, the sincerity of, of Cornelius is so overflowing that he cannot help himself but express his excitement that Peter is there. As Peter op <laughs> enters into the room, he sees that Cornelius has gathered his family, his neighbors, his best friends. Everybody's waiting for him in the living room. And then Peter says, these words you all you are aware you're well aware that it is against our law for a jew to associate with the gentile now think about that for a second it is against our law for a jew to associate with the gentile i want you to i want you to think what if we had peter on the, on the couch here and we were to ask peter where, where did you get that from it is against our law right is it possible that sometimes our law is not God's law? Is that possible? That sometimes in, in, in the, the, the structure, this thing that, that is fabricated in the church, that there are laws that have nothing to do with God's law. Here we have Peter presented in this, with this incredible situation. And the, and the first thing he can think of is that there's, there's a law that prohibits our encounter together. And he specifically says it is our law. Obviously here, this is something that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And Peter has basically Im imbibed this, 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 this perspective. And then his next words, he says, but God has shown me, right? It is against our law for you to be with the Gentile. And then he says, but God has shown me not to call any person unclean. And there it is. He understood, he connected the dots that the vision had to do with his encounter with this man. And, the, and, and, and throughout the course of this, Peter begins to preach and he sees the people and he says this in verse 34. Then Peter began to speak, I now realize that it is true, how true it is, that God does not show favoritism. Now listen to me. This is Acts chapter 10, which means we've already gone through Acts chapter 2. And this is Peter who was the featured preacher at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And he's saying... Oh, I now realize that God doesn't keep people out of his covenant promises. Could you imagine the shock value here? 
I mean, how, how could it be that I now realize this? We, we, we open the presentation showing that it's, it's, it's unavoidable, it's impossible to miss from the very beginning of this story, from the prophets, that I kept it simple for a reason, that the whole point of the whole thing, right, was the single idea that God's promises are inclusive and to include, when God draws a circle, his, circles, his circle is much larger than our circle. The whole point of the promises of God in the Old Testament were contingent on the Gentiles. And here we have downstream, way downstream in this story. We have the featured preacher of the New Testament church, of the apostolic circle. And the most basic concept is the very thing that he completely misses. And now, what happened to three years walking and talking with Jesus? And now he says... Now I realize that God doesn't show favoritism and that God is about inclus- inclusion and including. And his circle is broader and wider and bigger. This is incredible to me. There is nothing new here is my point. Nothing new. Nothing new has been introduced into the gospel narrative. This is the same old thing from the very beginning. And yet here we have even post-Pentecost, we have deep-seated racism. We have deep-seated cultural bias. We have division. This is post-Pentecost. It's incredible. This is Acts chapter 10. It took an encounter where Peter actually came face-to-face in order for him to get it. All of this to bring us here. I made a big to-do about how Acts chapter 10 is the story of the conversion of Cornelius, 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 Cornelius. And the more I read the story, the more I begin to wonder, maybe it has very little to do with Cornelius, and it has a whole lot to do with Peter. Because in this story, we don't just have a conversion experience, one conversion experience documented. We have two conversion experiences. We have the conversion or the reconversion of Peter himself. And that is, that is a radical twist and turn in this story and in the book of Acts. After Peter's done preaching, these pagans, these Gentiles, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit falls upon them and they begin to speak in tongues. They're not baptized yet. They're not in official membership in the church yet. And they are speaking in tongues. And Peter and the people that are with him are in utter shock. Why? Because this doesn't fit the box. Right? There's a formula of how the Holy Spirit is supposed to be poured out upon the people. And here we're seeing in Acts chapter 10, it is violating the formula. And yet we have here the undeniable evidence of these people who are being filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit is being poured down upon them. See, Peter's learning here in this moment that you can't put God in a box, right? That God is going to work and God is going to manifest in all kinds of ways that we can't even imagine, right? And that the New Testament church couldn't even imagine. Peter says, where's the water? (laughs) Peter sees this, he says, where's the water? Get the bathtub going. Who in their right mind, he says, can get in the way between them and God now? When this story is told, the reason that the story of Cornelius is is so long and it shows up over and over again is because after Peter finishes here, he has to go back to Jerusalem. (laughs) And when he gets back to Jerusalem, guess who's waiting for him in Jerusalem because the rumors have already made it back to Jerusalem. The brethren are waiting for him. He gets back to Jerusalem, and he walks in, and they're all waiting for him. And they essentially say, now we're in Acts chapter 11. They say, what in the world were you thinking? Right? And Peter's there with his, with his guys or whether he goes, hey, they were, they were with me too. And they're, and they're in the background. What were you thinking? And Peter rehearses the entire story 
again. So when I, I pictured Luke writing this story, Luke, the Gentile writer, and he's looking for excuses to retell it, to retell it, to retell it, to retell it, and to retell it. And that's why it's so long and so overplayed in, in, in this passage of Scripture. Peter has to defend God's large-hearted vision to the rest of the church. And he tells them the story. There was this guy named Cornelius. He had this vision. He came to get me. I was in my vision. And I I went into the room, and I saw them, and I began to preach. And before the words can come out of my mouth, the spirit fell. They started speaking in tongues. And then Peter says the statement one more time. He says, who could stand in the way between them and the water? Can you say amen to that? The story of Christianity, I have the privilege of teaching history of Christianity here. The story of Christianity, because we're done with the old, it is a long chronicle of God trying to tell the church to get out of the way. You with me? Who could stand in the way is what Peter said. I love the way that... um, I love the way that it says it here in Acts of the Apostles as we bring this thing to a close. On hearing this account, the brethren were silenced. Brethren meaning the church. Convinced that Peter's course was in direct fulfillment of the plan of God and that their prejudices and exclusiveness were utterly contrary to the spirit of the gospel, they glorified God saying, then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And then this one. Thus, without controversy. This is the good news. You guys ready for the good news? Without controversy. Prejudice was what, everybody? Broken down. And this is to this language. The exclusiveness established by the custom of the ages was abandoned. And the way was opened for the gospel to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. When I read the story, my question is, who needed this encounter more? Was it this pagan Gentile who was searching for God? Or was it the church member in this story? Who needed this encounter more? Right? For whom is this written? God could have easily... God could have easily communicated what needed to be communicated in the story, and yet it was Peter that needed to come into the picture because God understood that in order for the church to understand his bigger vision, they had to encounter, they had to have a reconversion encounter. So the social alignment that is promised in all of these, cov- in all of these promises in the covenant in the Old Testament that were about The Gentiles, the Gentiles, the Gentiles that would break down the divisions, the break down the the, the walls of separation. All of that uh, comes into fulfillment in this story here of, of Peter and Cornelius. So brothers and sisters, as we close uh, tonight, I believe that God is calling the church today to capture this vision because we read these things in the Old Testament, we read these things in the New Testament, but the question is, what are the analogies today? Is it, is it possible that God is up to larger things? Is it possible that there are people in this world that are having encounters with God that don't fit into our, our imagination or our conception of what God is doing with, with the people in this world? And is it possible that this was the true Pentecost? That Pentecost chapter 2, or or Acts chapter 2, records the book of uh, the the experience of Pentecost. That this is the actual Pentecost. This is Pentecost 2.0. And this is the outpouring of the Spirit, I suggest to you, that really stayed with Peter and that really stayed with the church. And it is because of this outpouring of the Spirit that the gospel goes to the Gentiles and that Christianity goes through the, throughout the Mediterranean world, it is because of this Pentecostal experience here in Acts chapter 10 and 11 that, that the
the gospel is going to go to the whole world. And if it was true back then, I believe that this is the message that will revive the church today. This is the vision that will revive the church today in the experience that it was the church member that needed this conversion experience and not Cornelius. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that we too would sense, that we too would get a glimpse of the large heartedness of your promises. Father, I pray that we would not lose the plot, that we would capture this vision that you have laid down of old from the Old Testament prophets. Lord, Acts chapter 28, we, we are writing the book of Acts today, Lord, and I pray that the chapters that we write will be consistent to the promises, uh, to the promises of God. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Amen. As you were sharing your message um, and we were preparing to worship again, I was thinking something that they had in common, the Jews and the Gentiles who believed was they had Jesus in common. And that is something we still have in common today. So we're going to sing, this is my story, this is my song, because we have Jesus in common. That is our story. So would you stand with us as we worship? Amazing God, we come before you right now, Jesus, and we say, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we're yearning for your blessing. We're yearning to be the kind of people that look at others through your lenses and not our own. 
God, may we love aboundingly. May we love more graciously. But Father, may we love with your spirit within us. Baptize your people now tonight. May they sense your peace as they exit this place. May they sense a greater knowledge of who you are. And may they know that you are coming back soon. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Friends, have a seat. i got a few wonderful things to share with you. We have asked the Light Bears team to help us equip you a little bit further. And they said, we've got something that we want to share with them that will really, really bless them. So I'm going to invite Pastor Ty to come back up here. And he's going to share something with you that will deepen your discipleship journey. He shared just briefly about it when he preached the first night. I want to have him just share with you about this amazing resource that you only have access to for the best opportunity till today at midnight. Okay, first of all, um, Philip, you have really good taste in eyewear. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, what you see on the screen, do you see it on the screen? Um, we, David and I, um, Jeffrey is one of the instructors as well that you will encounter. We run a discipleship school called Arise. We run that school every year, beginning in February, in Australia. That's where we conduct the Arise program. It's a three-month discipleship course. The curriculum is called The Story. We move through the entire biblical narrative, Genesis to Revelation, in a very rich, gospel-centered, character-of-God-oriented kind of context. Um, by the way, I'll just throw this in because we're excited about it. We are coming this August launching a second Arise Discipleship School in Europe in Finland. Wow. And that's going to be exciting as well. But we filmed the entire program and um, we have what's called Arise Online. So it's arise.online. And anywhere from a grocery store parking lot, it doesn't matter where you are, in your home, anybody can take the course. Not everybody can, you know, just uproot their lives for three months and go to Australia and hang out with us over there and be on those beautiful beaches and surf and study the Bible. Not everybody can do that. But, but what you can do is you can, you can get the whole course for life so you can do it at your own pace, and you can watch all the classes. The primary instructors are David, myself, Jeffrey, and then we have other instructors as well. And it's an amazing course, and until midnight tonight, our team is telling us um, it's been on sale for about a week now. Until midnight tonight, just snap a photo and at least look at it. Even if you go look at it and say, ah, I don't want this, that's fine. Snap a photo, go take a look at Arise Online slash New Year, and it's 70% off, so you can get it for lifetime access for $149, and you can do a small group, you can do it by yourself, and uh, you, can, you could just do the classes on the Book of Romans if you want, and, it, and it's worth doing it. Um, so it's, it's the entire Arise course until midnight tonight, it's just $149, which is 70% off. It's a great discipleship opportunity, and it's like, uh, it's like seminary for everyone. And, and you can just move through the whole Bible and encounter the, the love of God in, in every doctrine of Scripture. So it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Jeffrey's one of the teachers, myself, David, and a number of others. Wow. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be a big salesman here, but I really want to sell it here. So you're saying 149 is 70% off. So what is it, full price? <laughs> That's over 500 bucks. That's, Come on now. Over, but yeah. Okay, right about there. <laughs> Friends, get your deal before midnight tonight, and I always encourage people, find accountability when you're doing something great for the Lord. Always go two by two, get someone saying, hey, listen, I want to do this, but I really need that accountability. I want to go through this with you. I want to deepen my faith with you. You know, sin always likes to find a friend. That's how it always works. Hey, I'm going to go do this. You want to come? Why not do that for Jesus for a great thing? You're good. Why come on. I know. I just, I know, anyways. And, and now you got one more thing. Come back, Ty. Come back, come back, come back. We want to tell you about what happened this morning. Ty had a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation on an intelligent atheism that they started for the real religion week of renewal. Tell us just a little bit about that. Okay, so 
you're invited to that. It's for the students. Um, we were really blessed to have a, a pretty good turnout. It, it was great. I think that's because they're required to come or something. But um, <laughs> it was good. They came. And it's a five-part series. To, today was part one. Um, David and I are team teaching that. So uh, I taught today. David is tomorrow morning at, is it, it's 11 o'clock. David is here. Mine today was an intelligent atheism. Uh, tomorrow his is an intelligent faith. Um, and then the next day, I'll do God and evil, which is on theodicy. If God exists, then why is there evil and suffering in the world? And, and then David will follow up with, with part four on uh, faith and reason, which are not contrary to one another. Um, and then the fifth session, David and I will team teach together called the universal desire. And so you're invited to come. That's during the day at 11 o'clock, and, and we hope you'll... Uh, consider coming. I mean, what else are you going to do? Just stay home and nap or what? I, go to work? Go to work? You got a job? No. Yeah, just call in sick and come here. It's for the week of renewal for your life. It's worth it. I like it. All right. Well, you can get the archives for all of those sermons on our website. Our media team is going at 110% to make sure you have the very best and access to all of this. For everyone watching online, we want you to be there. We're going to live stream it on our church YouTube channel. There you can find all the sermons. I want to encourage you to subscribe and like every video that you watch. It just keeps the algorithm growing and expanding those people who can watch this. So please, please watch that. Share that with someone. You've got to do it. Friends, this evening, I want to encourage you to take some time to say hello to someone next to you. Uh, Professor Dr. Rosario will be over in the fellowship hall to say hello to you. And tonight as you walk out, if you'd like to continue to contribute, just a little blessing from your heart financially in worship for these sort of events. You can give right outside those doors. There will be offering plates. You can also use the QR code right here right now. If you pull out your phone, you can give a little offering that way as well. Thank you so much for partnering with us in that. Well, right now we want to give you that chance again as we did last evening. We love taking prayer so seriously because we believe that when we pray together for our burdens as a family, as a community, we will see God move in powerful ways and to have an accountability partner in prayer. And so this evening to your left right here in the transepts, there will be our prayer team who's ready to pray with you right now. Online, those of you watching, we have our prayer team ready to be on for 30 minutes. Just call in that phone number. The phone number right here, 909-361-6220, and put in then that number, 11125-POUND, and you'll jump into the prayer line. We love you, friends. We'll see you right here at the same place. Bring someone with you. I don't want to say don't come without someone, but, but I'm going to tell you, you better bring someone. So I love you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow evening.